Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I am your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, is Phil McKenzie, and uh, we are here to discuss some fights coming up in the week ahead of us. Another UFC event. Surprise, surprise. Um, this one main evented by Al Iaquinta and Donald the Cowboy Cerrone. <laughs> Uh, two other fights in that card that we want to touch on in addition to that main event, the co-main event. Strap yourselves in, folks. It's middleweight as fuck. It's Derek Brunson versus Elias Theodoro. You won't enjoy it. Shit, yes. <laughs> Derek Brunson certainly won't enjoy it, but Phil and I will, and we are hyped to talk to you about it. And then the fight just preceding that, Cub Swanton is fighting Shane Burgos. Kind of an interesting uh, crossroads fight there between the up-and-coming, the yet-up-and-coming Burgos and the slightly past his prime, uh, well, decently past his prime at this point veteran in Cub Swanton. After that, we are going to go back and touch on last week's fights. And uh, Phil, while we're at it, uh, getting to those recaps, should we also talk about uh, the fight that Rory McDonald had with a 900-year-old John Fitch? Yeah, I think we can actually touch on that because okay. I'm, I've always been a huge uh, Rory Mac fan. Mm-hmm. And this was sort of, I mean... Painful? I don't know if, I don't know if painful is the right word, but it's, it's definitely poignant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll get to that in our recap section later in the show as well. I'll try to make some effort to cover some Bellator fights. I know there's a select vocal portion of you listeners who really want that. And uh, to be honest, I wouldn't mind doing a little more of it myself because boy, oh boy, this UFC schedule. Uh, (laughs) Sometimes it weighs on the soul. But uh, before any of that, why don't we go ahead and start next week's UFC event. This one taking place in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Al Iaquinta. Donald Cerrone, the main event. Um, Phil, I want to start off by saying I now like Al Iaquinta. This is... You were supposed to gasp. We talked about this before. You said you were going to gasp. (gasps) Yes, thank you. (laughs) I have had my doubts about Al Iaquinta for a while. Um, No, not in like any any particularly... um, profound way i didn't like i don't it's hard it's hard to dislike ally quinta you know he's got an insane temper but otherwise you know he's funny he's charming he's weird his fights are generally quite exciting um uh but you know for quite a while i had a stretch where i was just like always picking against ally quinta i didn't get why he was winning so many matchups and everyone i was like ah, he still didn't tell me anything about ally quinta Eventually, I think it forced me, after that last fight of his against Kevin Lee, to reassess what it is about Ali Quinta's game that works. And I think it has given me a new appreciation for Ali Quinta that, coupled with the realization, uh, something that I think it had become too easy to forget because of how sort of bizarre the path of his career has been. The fact that he had a, uh, I think we can fairly say even now, an undeserved spot in the top 10 for quite a while, despite not fighting any ranked opponents, you know, this, uh, all of this, it, it was, it became easy for me to forget that though he is now 31, Iaquinta's pro career only began in 2009. And so with the inactivity and everything uh, added in there, kind of was starting to hit his stride only by around 2016, 2017. Uh, a couple years ago. So I think we're now seeing what Ally Quinta is capable of. The fight with Kevin Lee was really impressive to me. And, um, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what he can do against Donald Zeroni. This is like, I, I'm now in a position where I want to see what Ally Quinta can prove. Uh, what, what variety of opponents he can beat. I, I am in a position now where I am looking forward to each new Ally Quinta fight. So. Please pat me on the back for that. I, I beg you. <laughs> so, is what it has taken to become appreciative of Ally Quinta, you recognizing the fact that he is basically lightweight's Raphael Asensau? Um, I'm offended by that comparison, actually. I hate Al again, uh, now that you've said that. 
<laughs> what, what makes you say? I'll, I'll tell you who I automatically compare him to actually in my mind, uh, is boxer Danny Garcia, Danny Swift Garcia, um, whom I, I once ran a very, I once wrote a very inflammatory defense of on badlefthook.com called Dan- <laughs> you hate Danny Garcia because he's so good. <laughs> that was the name of that piece. People still don't like Danny Garcia. And for some deserved reasons, the man has famously cherry picked and fought some seriously overmatched competition. Um, but I had my moment with, um, I, I beating Kevin Lee reminded me strongly of the feeling I had watching Danny Garcia beat Lucas Matisse back in the day, where I, like a lot of boxing fans, was very excited by Matisse, was sort of expecting him to win what looked like a battle of punchers just by being the tougher one and the harder hitting one. And watching that fight, I began to view Danny Garcia in the light of someone who is unremarkably but very consistently good at what he does, well put together, balanced, uh, just solid technique and a game that functions combined with toughness and a real sort of measured attitude. Like Danny Garcia, very difficult to shake, very difficult to put off. He's just sort of a steady, he seems average in so many ways, but he's a steady fighter. And that's how I look at Ally Quinta now. Why do you make the Asunsao comparison? Because he's increasingly, it's increasingly apparent that he's pretty good everywhere. Mm-hmm. I've had questions about his grappling in the past, but I think, as you've sort of alluded to just there, those can be those can be assigned to an, a kind of overconfidence in his grappling game yeah. early on. They're prospect the, submission know, losses. He was when 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 Michael Chiesa submitted him, he was uh, three years into his career. When Mitch Clark got him, he was uh, five years into his career. You know, like it makes a lot more sense when you put it in context. Yeah, because since then he has proven to be a very, a very well-rounded grappler. Yeah, like someone who is, and so that that's basically where the where the comparison comes from is that he's he's a he's a classic spoiler. He's well round. <coughs> he's, he's well rounded everywhere. He hits just hard enough to be able to knock people out, mm-hmm. to be able to hurt people, but not really hard enough to be able to knock top level fighters out. And he is smart and tough enough to be able to maximize that. Mm-hmm. Uh, unlike Hassan Sal, though, he doesn't fight very often, and so it's been a little harder to gain useful data on him. You know, this is the problem, is that he's gone from fighting people right at the top of the division to incredibly faded names, yeah. and with very little in between. He's only, you know, if you go from sort of Ross, Pe- Ross Pearson at the tail end of his prime is probably the closest person he's fought to like a mid tier guy. Mm -hmm. And other than that, it's pretty much just people that you'd expect him to destroy. And then elite talent right at the top of the division. Yeah. There was Jorge Masvidal, uh, of course, which is maybe at least at that time would have been considered more mid tier talent. But then again, that's a fight that most people watching did not think Al won. Yeah. I mean, it won bloody elbows robbery of the year award. Mm -hmm. And as it's been proven, like taking on Jorge Masvidal in a pure, like mid range boxing, kickboxing fight is tough to do. Yeah. And yeah, I look at it in that context. Now I'm like, look what Jorge Masvidal did to Darren fucking till. I go back and watch that and I'm like, I quit to fight a good fight here. He got his licks in, you know, he, he, he adjusted. Yeah. He's, he's a, a really fearless, tough, determined and just well put together fighter um very well rounded and like overconfident maybe at one point but now he's got a real kind of measured confidence uh, and aggression to him that i like so um how do you think he matches up with donald cerrone i'm not sure yeah it either. comes down to like it's it's a real tricky one cuz i'm still not sure how much i trust donald cerrone's durability he hasn't really been hurt much at lightweight because since his return but i can't think that it's that great nowadays Mm -hmm. i definitely think iaquinta is the tougher fighter should it you know become a bit of a war and i i'm whilst cerrone did fine against uh what's his face arrogant dude kevin lee is that arrogant dude? cerrone oh cerrone Cerrone. did Um, uh hernandez oh yes um what's he defined against him it wasn't like he was 
clearly in the driver's seat for most of it. Yeah. So I'm still somewhat on the fence about whether Cerrone can actually survive a protracted, tough fight with a top-end lightweight at that class anymore. And the other thing is, though, how well does... Uh, how well does Iaquinta deal with kicks? Mm-hmm. Because his general operand, his general modus operandi is that he's going to sort of patiently press forward and sort of stay over at his feet. And that's traditionally been a style which kind of gets carved up on the outside by really dedicated kickers. Mm-hmm. He's fairly heavy on the front foot. Um, also, just the posture and the way that that uh, Iaquinta fights, the sort of inching forward. Uh, usually, I mean, he's quite a good aggressive counterpuncher. Um, mm-hmm. He does a very good job of, of pulling counters, but countering punches. And that posture reads Cerrone knee to me all day. Um, I can I can very clearly see Iaquinta walking repeatedly into those big counter knees that Cerrone loves to throw. Um. Also, also, I can just see him getting just getting lit up from the outside because yeah. he does often tend to just kind of hang out. You know, as in, for example, the Khabib fight. And admittedly, he was very scared of the takedown there, but he does like to kind of stand at a range and step and throw. Yeah. And traditionally, if you're not forcing Donald Cerrone backwards, he's perfectly happy to just stand there and then. Uh, like just start unloading kicks to the body in the head. Yeah. This is the thing about Ally Quinta though. Um, when he fought Kevin Lee, Kevin Lee landed some solid kicks. He, he kicked the inside leg. He hit some big, big body kicks. Aya Quinta did what Jorge Masvidal did so successfully to Donald Cerrone. He count, he started countering almost immediately when the kick started landing. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to take a few or get hit. He knew, uh oh, I'm having trouble seeing these coming and or defending them. I'm going to fucking smack him on the chin when he tries to throw one. And that is something that I, I can see seriously troubling Cerrone. Like one of my favorite things now about Iaquinta is his, his willingness to trade shots um, intelligently. You know, his, his willingness to recognize when he's having trouble dealing with something and the very simple but difficult for a lot of fighters to wrap their head around reasoning that if he's going to hit me, I'd better hit him accurately and hard right at the same time. Um, and that is something Cerrone has consistently struggled with. I think, uh, that like Masvidal just wrecked him countering those kicks. And yeah, I'm, I'm concerned for Cerrone's sake for that. Uh, so here's a question. How good of a pressure fighter is Alec Quinta? How good is his pressure fighting footwork? Uh, or does it not matter because he does that sort of, he's really a stalker. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't swarm people. He's a very methodical, slow pressure fighter. So does it matter that he's cutting off the cage and all that if he's not really putting a ton of, um, like that mental pressure on Cerrone that he has had trouble with in the past? Yeah, that's the thing. He's he's as you mentioned, he's not really a pressure fighter at all. And it was nice in the in the Lee fight in particular to see him. Yeah, when he countered, he countered in combination. Yeah. So that he was he was moving forward behind, you know, two three strikes. Because if you want to get to someone like Cerrone, you do you obviously need to be backing him up and you need to be discouraging him. Um, but yeah, primarily, uh, like I said, he he's someone that. He is a mid range. He is a mid range fighter. Yeah. And so the other question is, how much does his reach help him out there? Because he's he's got he's he's one of those guys with monkey arms, uh-huh. right? Who has kind of weirdly long arms for his frame. Mm-hmm. And whilst it was traditional, like people thought that to get to Cerrone, you know, you kind of needed to be a southpaw. You need to be a real pressure fighter. Masvidal really isn't that. Masvidal is also a mid range. He is a a mid range orthodox. Uh, boxer, mm-hmm. you know, it's something that you would expect Cowboy to be able to deal with. But a Masvidal is a pretty good boxer. B Masvidal is particularly good at kicking, uh, countering kicks. And C Masvidal is one of those people who has a uh, who has like reach parity with Cerrone. Mm-hmm. So yeah, is it possible that Iaquinta can kind of 
stick at um, Cerrone's stick at Cerrone's preferred like stick at preferred Cerrone's preferred range in the same way that Iaquinta did. Catch kicks, come back with combinations uh, after Cerrone throws them, uh, and just kind of out tough and out volume him. Because if you can, if people have pressured him consistently, uh, not necessarily pressured him, but forced him into that range, ju- that slice of range just inside his kicks uh, consistently. And, you know, Benson Henderson obviously did this as well in their third fight where he got kind of robbed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cerrone will box with you. He will consent to throw hands for long periods of time. Mm-hmm. Leon Leon Edwards also did this. You know, you can force him into a boxing match. And, and should Iaquin to be able to do that, he will almost certainly win that. He is more durable, and he is just a he is just a better boxer. Yeah, I I tend to agree. Um, and I Quinta, like as much as some of it does scream vulnerability to knees uh, and head kicks, which again, like people have given him trouble with those strikes in the past. He's been caught by a few and narrowly, narrowly avoided plenty of others. I'm watching him fight Kevin Lee right now, and like uh, as stiff as Lee is with the attempts. Um, He's having success uh, or coming very close with a lot of his, his, his kicks. And, of course, I think Donald Cerrone is slightly better at kicking than Kevin Lee. Um, the, the thing I, I like Iaquinta's defense, I like his ability to fight layers deep into an exchange. Uh, combinations, power punches, another major factor, uh, Iaquinta is a capable and usually fairly consistent body puncher. Mm-hmm. Um, and against Donald Cerrone, that target is going to be wide open. I think he will, it, it'll be a shock if he doesn't come into this fight and immediately start chasing that target. It's going to be easy to hit, uh, given the height disparity and it's Cerrone. Uh, he's, he's got trouble with that shit. And yeah, like watching Iaquinta calmly, uh, work his way out of bad positions on the ground against Kevin Lee, a significantly stronger fighter than Donald Cerrone. Um, Watching him methodically defend the back mount from one of the most dangerous fighters from that position, I'm like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem – Donald Cerrone has pretty much always been a fighter who lives and dies by the sword. And I think Iaquint is down for that kind of fight, and I think he's a lot less likely to be finished at this stage in his career. So maybe it's just my new Iaquinta fandom, but yeah, I, I think I have to pick Al here. Yeah, I think I, I was actually coming in expecting to pick Cerrone, but the more I look at it and the more I think of the amount of people that have been able to get to, to Cerrone, it is, yeah, it, it's not even necessarily, uh, as, as we said, it's not even necessarily hardcore pressure fighters. It's not, you know, Benson Henderson in, is, is has never been someone you would classify as a pressure fighter. No, I mean, maybe in his very early career i mean but even then he was mostly just a kind of wild man but in that third fight it was simply his comfort in range Mm -hmm. and again not particularly a not a devastatingly not devastatingly skilled stand-up striker either but he was comfortable inside he was comfortable enough to creep his way inside the slice of range where uh cerrone's kicks come alive and once you're in boxing range with cerrone he is not he is just not a particularly deep fighter. He's definitely become more so underneath uh, Six Gun Gibson. Mm-hmm. You know, he's definitely a much better. He's a he's a better boxer, but he's not a particularly deep one. No. It's pretty much you know slip left hook counter is what he's added to his game. He, he's essentially and, under Brandon Gibson finally picked up a few rote defensive moves that he'd never yeah. had throughout most of his career. But yeah, I think. The Masvidal, I think the Masvidal fight is probably the most uh, the most illustrative one. I don't think uh, I don't think Iaquinta is as good as, as at Masvidal at countering kicks. That is one of Masvidal's special, yeah. specialities. He is extremely good at countering kicks, but um, but yeah, I think he can just sit inside that range, make it a boxing match. I don't know if he can finish Cerrone, but given I that I don't trust Cerrone's durability, given the fact that he he goes to the body and that his pace is higher than it used to be. Like maybe he can finish Cerrone, and it will certainly be a statement, and maybe it will set him up with that cowboy fight he wants. But 
I will also, I will say, not be hugely surprised to see if if Iaquinta gets just stuck, sort of plodding around the outside and gets carved up. Yeah, he is a very plodding fighter. It, it, it is inherent to his style. Uh, his his the way that he likes to duck under shots and come back with counters. The way that he tends to throw everything, not with like huge tensed up power, but with a strong base of power. Um. Like you can you can credit him for for not getting past his feet, but the way he gets that done does result in a lot of rooted uh, punching. And yeah, if Cerrone's on and can start working early from that long range, um, he he could still run some circles around Iaquinta. But I think those the kick counters, the pressure, uh, the body shots. Um, I just think and 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 very importantly, the durability and confidence of Iaquinta. Uh, I have to favor him. Yep, I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Ike Winter as well. Um, mm. But yeah, it should be. But I'm, I'm really interested in this one. It should be a lot of fun. All right. Uh, well, let's take a break. When we come back in segment two, we are going to discuss Derek Brunson versus Elias Theodoro, aka the world's most frightened mixed martial artist versus the UFC's least threatening middleweight. <laughs> After that, <laughs> Cub Swanson versus Shane Burgos, and then we will move on to our various recaps, Jacare versus Hermanson, and the rest from that card. Quite a lot of interesting uh, interesting dis- uh, results to discuss there. And as we mentioned before, we are also going to touch on Rory McDonald versus John Fitch from last weekend's Bellator card. All of that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Okay, folks, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are moving on down through the rest of this UFC Cerrone versus Iaquinta card. I guess it's Iaquinta versus Cerrone at this point. How time turns, Phil. Iaquinta being named first in the matchup. Unbelievable. Um, all right. The co-main event. Derek Brunson, Elias Theodoro. This fight is going to be, in one way or another, horrible and beautiful. <laughs> it is <laughs> one of the silliest matchups I could possibly consider. Um, now, our main theory, I having said that, okay, I want to start us off on a very depressing foot. Having said that, our main theory, uh, the dynamic we saw here was, how will Derek Brunson convince himself to be very, very nervous about the almost literally meaningless volume that Elias Theodore is striking is entirely comprised of? Um, and I want to raise a counterpoint to that to a way that this matchup may very well go, which is that he won't. He will instead engage Elias Theodoro in a slow-paced long range kickboxing match a la the one he had with Anderson Silva. Do you think that is possible? Oh God. Because here's the thing. You this is what triggered this thought in my head. Just before we began this segment, we were daydreaming about how beautiful a Derek Brunson versus Tiago Santos matchup would have been had it ever occurred. And you said there's a strong chance in that matchup Tiago Santos scares Derek Brunson into knocking him out. That's the thing. Yep. Elias Theodoru maybe will be the only one Derek Brunson's ever fought who won't scare him. He, Derek Brunson will not feel any of the usual pressure he feels because he's not going to be hit being hit hard. He's not going to get hit with very many straight shots to the chin. You know, it's most of Theodoru's volume that actually lands is like leg and body kicks. So if it just sticks Brunson at range, what kind of fight does that give us? I so it could very well be basically Theodoru Anders part two, right? Yes. That's what you're suggesting. Yes. Is that we just get a much bigger, much more powerful fighter just aimlessly following Theodoru around the cage doing absolutely fuck all. Yes. 
and that would be terrible. And but Brunson has only really done that once. And I will say that the I I have actually gone on record as I will defend that that Brunson Silver fight in that it was much better than I thought it was when I watched it back. Like Silver in general, I think I have when I've watched his fights back, I have think I've been underplaying how much of a threat he is nowadays in that he is actually still pretty nasty. Mm-hmm. He will still like it's not all him bullshitting people. It is mixed up with points where he will actually have genuine bursts of clinch offense. He will throw in combination. He will hit elbows and knees and such like. He is you can see that he he still genuinely has like some pop to him. Mm-hmm. So I can kind of forgive that from from Brunson. But he's never really done that again. And more to the point, he's also generally tended to do pretty well against people who rely on a lot of aimless movement. Whilst Brunson tends to fight like he's a blind man a lot of the time in that he needs to basically get his hands on people before he can start hitting them, he's not that bad at closing down distance to do that. It's that the once he gets his 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 last bit of closing range is often like dangerous for him because like I said he does sort of tend to fight like he can't see the other guy but he's when it comes to just cutting people off with strikes he's got he's pretty good at setting up the right hook and the left hand. He's good at kicking his way inside. He's good at kind of cutting people off in a kind of slightly Matt Brown way. Mm-hmm. So if you think of things mm-hmm. like... I like that comparison. Uh, yeah, if you, if you think of things like... Um, so Lyoto Machida and Uriah Hall, mm-hmm. both guys who are just going to back up a lot, circle, ha- go for low-volume games whilst they try and set up strikes from the outside. And he just fucked them both up. Like... He, I think, in some ways, and also Lawrence Larkin, also, much more dyna- a much more dynamic and higher pace fighter than either of those guys. And admittedly, some of these performances were, you know, when he was with Jackson Wink, who I think were actually a genuinely good influence on him. Uh, but I think he just get he gets a lot of confidence when he sees guys like backing up from him. He's like, yeah, you know who's the man? I'm the man. Yeah, I think you're right. the The reaction he had to Anderson Silva was, I mean, coming into that bout. He had, of course, just been knocked out by Robert Whitaker. He'd had a huge successful run of killing everyone in the first two or three minutes of a fight. And then he, I mean, to, to add to your theory, by the way, like he did have some early success against Robert Whitaker. Yeah. People forget that because of how absurdly he fell apart and it just clung to that tiny bit of success right to his demise. Uh, after that, that, he, that Whitaker turned it around in, you know, hit him four times more viciously. But he did manage to back Whitaker up to the fence and cut him off with some nasty shots. And I really like that Matt Brown comparison, by the way. That sort of weirdly long-armed, reaching, falling all over yourself. But against an opponent who is either A, scared of what you're going to do to them, or B, not threatening with the offense they're going to respond with, uh, that, that strategy works. Like just being able to walk in and lunge after someone and anticipate where they're going to be with your shots uh, that works if you're a big puncher like the likes of uh, Brunson and Brown. Um, man, imagine if Derek Brunson just had Matt Brown's durability, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what a fighter he'd be. Um, but, uh, yeah, the thing with the Anderson Silva fight was that Brunson, uh, he, he came into that, you know, seemingly reacting to the knockout he had just suffered. And also, um, I'm I'm going to at least tepidly agree with you that Silva did give him some reasons to worry. Silva was at the very least threatening. Uh, however much of that was aura and confidence uh, as opposed to technique, I think it's always a bit of both these days with Anderson. Um, like you don't, you don't, you know, give Israel Adesanya difficulties just with the aura. Uh, but how, however, whatever that distribution of, of threateningness was, um, Brunson had to he he felt he had to be worried about what Anderson was going to do to him. And it is kind of hard to believe that he could feel that way against Theodoro. People get frustrated by Theodoro, 
But also, honestly, also that's yeah. that's also points out that Brunson won that fight. Yes, I, yeah, I agree. He did win the fight with Anderson <laughs> uh, because no matter what you say, there was a lot of bullshit from Anderson that he did not land that often. Um, so yeah, I think you're probably right. And uh, if that is the case, if that's what this matchup looks like, doesn't Derek Brunson win it? Yeah, I think he actually might be kind of a nightmare matchup for Theodoru. Right. I mean, kind of everyone is past a certain level because Theodoru's style is just not tremendously functional. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a pretty tough style matchup for him. Yeah. I mean. This is the thing is that Theodoru relies on being able to volume kick you from the outside and then to be able to tie you out if you clinch up with him. Yeah. But like Brunson is a really good clinch fighter and wrestler. Like he's really good there. Yeah. And you know who's not a particularly good wrestler, but does have some skills in the clinch, but is not a particularly good wrestler. Tiago Santos. What he is, is huge and strong and powerful. And Theodoru went to the clinch against him in their matchup um, treated it as a sort of safety zone and got fucked up there. He ate about a billion knees to the body. He ended up gassing out because the more athletic fighter was just able to rip him up on the inside. And yeah, Brunson yeah. can do some damage in that range, no doubt. And he also got kind of out grappled by Brad Tavares. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who's a good wrestler, but again, so is Derek Brunson. Yeah, he's not as good as Derek Brunson. <sighs> so, Derek Brunson? The question is, yep. um, if Thiago Santos couldn't do it, can he knock Elias Theodoru out? Because uh, however much you can sort of make fun of either of these guys' styles, however however much you can you can sort of laugh at the weirdness of, of Theodoru striking, he is undeniably a tough bastard. He is extremely he is, durable. He is unbelievably fucking tough. Yes. Like, I don't even remember him being badly hurt by Thiago Santos and – Tiago no. Santos, and he got beaten on for the most part of three rounds, is that he just seemed... I mean, actually, he got pretty badly hurt by Eric Anders at some point, I think. He looked Oh, uh, yeah, looked he was shaky. He had, he had to come back. That. And that, that was what was so particularly frustrating about it, that Anders hurt him and then did nothing the round after that and let yeah, Theodore well, win he, it. I think he just tied himself got out going for the finish. That makes sense, too. But, yeah, he is he is crazy tough. So yeah, I don't think I don't think uh, Brunson can finish him. Even though Brunson is a very very good finisher, tiring yourself out going for the finish is that a route to for Theodoru to victory? Because uh, something about Derek Brunson does not exactly scream longevity. Even if his opponent does not knock him out, he's maybe the most tense striker in the sport. Yeah, it's a possibility. But again, like I, that's the thing. I don't know. I never know how much that lock in fight is an unattainable pinnacle for Derek Brunson in, in, in terms of how good he could be. Yeah. Uh, but it, it always did at least show me that he can go three consistent rounds. Or the Romero uh, fight. But, Remember that fight? Yeah. God, Brunson looked weird. good in that fight. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, weird guys. <laughs> really <laughs> weird guys. Um, I think I'll take Derek Brunson. Like, I think he's yeah. going to hit Theodora really hard early. And, um, yeah, the difference between Anders and him is that Brunson can use his physicality to stall Theodora out in the clinch and rack up damage while he's doing that. Uh, Anders didn't really have that option. He's really not much of a wrestler at all. Uh, po he's a worse wrestler than Thiago Santos, uh, as was proven in their matchup. So, yeah, I, I think I have to pick Derek Brunson here. And I will be happy to see the anglerfish get another win. All right? I've been waiting for it. Yep. Yep. I'll be, ha I'll be happy to see Brunson get a win as well. I, yeah, yeah, I think it's just it's just a real tough matchup for Theodoru. I mean, but even if, if Theodoru does manage to win this, it will be kind of hilarious. Oh, yeah. The thing is, is like, look, we, we make fun of fighters. We have to have fun with this. We are not only analysts. We are fans of this sport. We have to get into the storylines and the characters. And uh, sometimes uh, a story is a comedy. <laughs> sometimes the characters are silly, and that's why you enjoy them. But, like, I have a lot of respect for both of these dudes. And Theodoru seems to have a really solid athletic ceiling. Uh, I think we saw that in the Santos fight. We saw it at periods in the Anders fight, and really Anders is 
you know, just not refined enough and probably never will be to avoid the problems he, he caused himself in that matchup. That being said, like, Theodoru showed in that matchup that if Brunson does not fight intelligently, there is a very real chance he could win his way to a hideous, he could work his way to a hideous win. Uh, yep. and you would have to respect it. Yep. If he can jank and run and kick <laughs> and hideous backhand his way to like genuinely elite fights or God forbid a title shot, it would it would make me laugh a lot. And also, it would make Luca Bordon's head explode. <laughs> if there's a continuum of the evolution of MMA jabs, you know, sort of crawling out of the water with uh, Benson Henderson's jab yeah. <laughs> right, on the, right on the beach, and at the end, it's like, I don't know, uh, Jose Aldo or Jorge Masvidal, um, Elias Theodoro is in the water. I'm just saying, <laughs> he's at the very beginning. That backhand is so bad. <laughs> but yeah, it's annoying, and he works hard, and he's super tough. So I am really looking forward to this matchup, even though it will almost certainly be some form of awful and ugly. Um, it's middleweight, baby. Okay, uh, final one to break down. We'll cover this one fairly quickly. Uh, Cub Swanson, Shane Burgos. Uh, what do you make of this one? Uh, another really like should be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Shane Burgos is like one of the more exciting talents to pop up in recent years. He's still really young in his he's still really young in his career. He's still mm-hmm. really young generally. Debuted in twenty thirteen. Uh, he's twenty eight years old. Yep, and has a shockingly coherent technical style. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the best of the. Uh, one of the most fun of the uh, Team Tiger Shulman uh, Matryoshka dolls mm-hmm. of bearded aggressive counter, counter punches. Mm-hmm. And so the question here is that he does seem like one of these guys who has perhaps slightly too much confidence in his own game. Yeah. That he's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but that he doesn't have unbreakable durability and he's very comfortable fighting in the pocket even when he hasn't completely figured out what the other guy's doing there which has meant that he's he's gotten into trouble he, he got outfoxed by calvin cater and he got dropped by kurt who was Holobar. it yeah kurt Holobar, mm-hmm. um who is a a super sneaky and super fun fighter mm-hmm. so and very unfortunate kurt Holobar is a very one of those guys who's really good and just yeah. it hasn't worked out in the ufc for him yeah, he really deserves like really deserves better. Yeah. Um. So, and the que- so the question here is: Is Cup Swanson one of these guys who can outfox and trick Shane Burgos? And I think the answer is probably yes. But also the question is like, where is Cup Swanson right now? Because mm-hmm. he looked kind of dreadful in his last fight, and he didn't really look very good against. I mean, he didn't really look very good in his last two fights. No. Uh, he looked surprisingly good. Uh, I mean, uh, and I say the last two because I thought he actually looked good against Brian Ortega. Um, but oh yeah, Edgar, I agree. I remember that he was landing those left hooks. He looked pretty sharp. Yeah. Yeah. If I could trust that guy to start, turn up, I think I would pick him over Burgos. But I'm not sure that I can. So I don't think I'm going to. I mean, he's shown that, you know, he showed against Du Ho Choi that what you do against a relatively inexperienced, perhaps overconfident striker is you just put a ton of pressure on him, you force him backwards, you make him make mistakes. You know, it, that was one of those ones where Swanson's game really came alive. But I just worry that his game doesn't seem like one which would age, which ages very well. No. It's, a lot of athleticism, a lot of movement, bursting in behind, you know, big dangerous hooks that he tends to try and throw from outside the the opponent's field of vision. Uh, you know, all his kind of stance switching, cartwheel kick stuff. I don't think the general Jackson Wink striking style is one which ages particularly well. And the fact that Swanson just looked incredibly out of sorts against Edgar and Moicano, just like he didn't know what to do in either fight. He's yeah. Just, like, 
he didn't he was clearly massively behind against Edgar and he just kind of accepted it in a way I've I've never seen him do before. Right, especially not long uh not not long on the heels after the Duha Choi fight. Where like he had some difficulties, he was in there and he really fought like he had something to prove. Like that was a guy who was not going to accept defeat in that matchup. And 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 it was not the same way. The difference is of course like there's very little in common style-wise between the likes of Moicano and Edgar and uh, Burgos. You know, there's the pressure of Frankie Edgar, uh, and we know Shane Burgos is going to do everything in his power to pressure. Uh, it's very rare that you see him back up. He was actually retreating and trying to counter off the back foot when Holobaugh dropped him. Um, so it can be done, you know, and there was a point in the Calvin Cater fight. He was upping the pressure, upping the pressure, upping the pressure. Cater was retreating more and more and more. And uh, one of Cater's big adjustments in the third round was to stand his ground and throw combinations. Um, and he did manage to back Burgos up and catch him while he was trying to create space and get away from a combination. So <clears throat> it's it's a matchup very much like the Duha Choi fight. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, particular differences in how Burgos throws his, his techniques and everything, but... Uh, like the, the similar dynamic is that it's going to be whoever comes forward is going to win this matchup. And in order to come forward, as he did against Duha Choi, Cub Swanson will have to exchange with Shane Burgos. You know what I mean? Like he's going to have to fight him off to get him to back up. And he is not Calvin Cater. He is not a patient, you know, um, lightly just letting his punches fly, flicking him out there, touching, touching, moving between each shot. He's a lunging, power-punching, dynamic, athletic style of striker, uh, as you said. So again, it's that, that results automatically in a fight that will at least periodically be pretty brutal. He's going to have to stand his ground and swing it out with Shane Burgos. And like, like I said, he, that's probably going to result in Burgos backing up at some points. Um, but part of that, uh, sometimes unearned confidence that Burgos displays is that he's, um, he, he's confident because he is capable of adjusting. Um, he knows he can adjust to an opponent. Uh, you know, when, when Kurt Holobaugh knocks him down and he, he's smiling before his shoulder blades hit the canvas and then immediately finish the fight with an arm bar, uh, like that's not a mistake. That is where that confidence comes in very handy. And, the turning point in Swanson's fight with Duha Choi was when he broke Korean Superboy's confidence. Um, he turned it into a dogfight and broke him. And I don't think that's possible with Burgos, or it's at least a lot harder. Uh, Burgos, he, he's just, uh, I don't know. He, he's, he's, he's got more in his toolkit than uh, Duha yeah, Choi. He is at least, um, amongst other things, he's a much more nuanced defensive fight. Yes. Like, you can see him reacting to strikes in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. He will slip, he will move his head off the center line, he will move back, he will parry. Duho Choi is, has basically the he, counter straight. and yeah, He pulls steps and, and he, throws a straight counter. That's his only defense, yeah. is to basically pull his head straight back. Yeah, and uh, apart from that, there really isn't a lot there. And... Burgess's tendency, Burgess's tendency, you can clearly see it, is that he is always trying to read deeply into striking exchanges. And sometimes he is he's just clearly overloading himself. Yeah. And sometimes he is, you know, he would do better just to, to be as simple as possible. But this also means that he's able to do things like he can slip two, three punches and then throw two, three punches back. Yep. This is not a common trait for an MMA fighter, let alone a relatively young and inexperienced one. Mm -hmm. But he is, I suspect that raw aggression is is just not going to be as effective as it was against Du Ho Choi. Yeah. And the other thing is that Burgess' troubles have often come when he's been drawn into lead hand battles. You know, the Cater the fight is a jab, is a a, a masterful uh, kind of jab fight and jabs and body works and just a, a building fight between two people where he just gets, as, as we mentioned, he just gets outfoxed. Mm -hmm. But, and even the Holobar fight, Holobar has a, has developed like a very nicely jab and it's one of the strikes, which is kind of 
decade out of Cub Swanson's game. Yeah. He really has become, you know, the the back in his his featherweight when he was look when he was on the run to what looked like it could be a title shot, his jab was starting to look really good. But since then he has kind of gone back to someone who just tries to freak people out with weird stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I, I, I tend just, to agree. So that's gonna work. Uh, to this day, my favorite Cub Swanson fight, the Ross Pearson one. I think that was like his most beautiful marriage of the technical boxing, the the craziness, the defense, the jab. And I remember his fight with Jeremy Stevens too. Like that's a yeah. de- that's a decent parallel, not nearly the same kind of uh, defensive capability, but balanced out by a lot more power. Um, even like Burgos is a good puncher, but I'm not sure that he's as powerful as Duha Choi. He's certainly not as powerful as Jeremy Stevens. And um, and Cub Swanson used his jab wonderfully in that fight. It was the punch that won him that match. Um, and yeah, I don't know. There's maybe some of that. Like, again, in that Brian Ortega fight, it was jabs and left hooks all day from Cub. And it looked really good. And that was against a pressure fighter who uh, sometimes thinks over much about how to respond defensively, about what kind of counters to come back with, can be a little sort of mechanical in how he does that. But again, I don't think Burgos is like that. Like, um, you know, when he was making the adjustments to Calvin Cater, he was coming under that jab. He was throwing these really quick, like, shoe shine combinations to the body. He was playing with rhythm changes mm-hmm. with his punches. He's just a deeper, more developed fighter than the likes of Ortega and Duha Choi when it comes to both pressure and counterfighting. So, um, I think it's a, it's definitely a winnable matchup for Cub. And like, if he can do what he did to do, Hot Choi stand his ground. We've seen Burgos dropped. Uh, there, there's opportunities there, but I, I think I have to take Burgos. Uh, yeah. It's also due to the fact that like the last time Cub Swanson finished someone was Dennis Seaver back in 2013. Right. Yeah. Which isn't to say that it couldn't happen. Like he has been hitting people super hard, but it hasn't yeah. been finishing them. So it, it's something, it's something to consider. All right. Um, well, both of us taking Shane Burgos there. Very intriguing fight. And uh, I wish I could say that for much of the rest of this card. Uh, although I do want to say uh, my, my sort of sneaky pick for, for someone you should watch, two of them. Vince Morales is fighting on this undercard against Ayaman Zahabi. Should be a fun fight. But Vince Morales, very good. Very well put together boxer. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing him in the cage again. The other one I'm really looking forward, uh, this is his, uh, who's also having his second UFC fight is Matt Sales, who uh, put on a... God, I, I keep forgetting who it was. He, he fought Shaman Rice. Uh, huge athletic disparity, and yet Sales showed off really, really solid boxing defense, uh, coupled with lots of pressure and constantly looking to turn those that those defensive moves into counter punches. So like, if Shaman Rice weren't just nine times a better athlete than him, Matt Sales probably would have found a way to win that fight. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next. So... Those are the ones I like on the undercard. Brad Katona, and Marab Dwalish Willie is uh, pretty interesting as well. But let's take a break. When we come yep. back, Jacare versus Hermanson, uh, Mike Perry versus Cowboy Oliveira, other silly shit, and Rory McDonald versus John Fitch, all of that after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are talking about Sunrise, Florida, literally the second time anyone, wait, no, the first time anyone has talked about Sunrise, Florida a second time. Um, Jack Hermanson fought Jacare Souza, a matchup that Jacare, understandably at the time, and even more so in retrospect, was not exactly happy that he felt pressured to accept because uh, this is a guy who just knocked out Chris Weidman, who has been a perennial top contender in the middleweight division, and who, uh, you know, foolish as he may have been to trust the word of Dana White or any of his cronies, was promised, 
a title shot with a win here, despite losing the uh, what was originally a fight against Yoel Romero. He accepted the bout with Jack Hermanson. And um, I got to say, Phil, I'm to borrow some of your uh, your limey parlance. I'm gutted for Jacare here. I, I really feel sympathetic for him because he had his moments. It looked like he might have been able to do it. He seemed super close to pulling it out at the very end. And I like Jacare. You know, he's a good fighter. He's he's old and he's been doing it a long time. It's difficult not to like him. And, uh, you know, despite that sadness, I have to acknowledge Jack Hermanson fought an excellent fight against him. Yeah, this was the performance of Jack Hermanson's career. Absolutely, Un- hands undoubtedly, down. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Like, his, his stand-up in particular looked vastly improved it was one of those one of those performances where you can look at how he was striking and be like oh that's what you've been trying to do this whole time Mm -hmm. yeah like the 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 lightness that he was with which he was letting his jab go was beautiful he landed tons and tons of jabs on uh jacare uh what really impressed me and this is something we specifically noted not seeing from him in the past last week his defense um, he was surprisingly hard to hit to the head for most of this matchup. The only times Jacare was consistently hitting him upstairs were in the two rounds where he was consistently attacking the body. He had to open up the head, but leading for the head, Hermanson was very difficult to hit clean. Yeah. Um, this was, as we said, like, I think one of the stories of this card and many of the interesting fights was that it was very clearly defined out fighter versus pressure fighter. Mm-hmm. Some guy, there was one guy who wanted to get inside and there was another guy, or as in, in the case of the Hill and Esquivel fight, somebody wanted to keep them on the outside. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what it came down to was initiative, I think. And in this fight, it was Hermanson's ability to establish his jab, which we noted that he struggles to do against southpaws, but that he also struggles to do against pure aggression, mm-hmm. that he was able to establish that really, really well against uh, against Jacare. And I think a lot of what it was, was that, that um, Jacare's pressuring style feeds off commitment, because he comes forward and he'll... He's gotten pretty good at using like little subtle head movements to get in past shots. Mm-hmm. But what Jacare is constantly doing is he is going, when is the real shot coming? When the real shot comes, that is when I'm going to come in behind the right hand and the left hook. Yeah. And when he was coming in on Hermanson, it was just like, is it real? Is it real? Is it real? Is it real? Oh, he's gone. And then he had to do it again. And he would come in and he would go, is it real? Is it real? And he would just, you know, he would he would slip one, two, three completely non-committal jabs, n- not throwing his his hand, his his counter shots because he knew that they weren't going. That you know, it was a, a a serious risk to do it at that point. But the thing is that you know the the completely non-committal jabs a started to add up, and b Hamanson was able to to slip in hard shots every now and again, mm-hmm. and that. Jacques Ray only really, he, he just couldn't rely on a committed shot coming back at him. It became far too difficult for him to detect when it was going to come. It, this, it, the dynamics of this fight reminded me a lot of the Weidman fight, the basic ways this played out, in that Weidman was doing much the same thing, in that he was just circling a lot, throwing non-committal shots, had a lot of success against Sosa. But then when Sosa just decided you know what, I'm not going to care anymore mm-hmm. about whether whether this is a hard shot coming back at me or whether it's a throwaway. I'm literally just going to walk into him and fuck him up. He had a lot of success. Uh, in this matchup, you mean? I mean, in both, in both yeah. of them. They're very, they're very similar. I thought they were very similar dynamics in both cases. Yeah, I, it I was agree. just that Jack Ray was able to sustain that offense less in this one. And Hermanson was just more disciplined than Weidman was. Yeah, Hermanson was tremendously disciplined. Another major difference, um, and this started early but but continued to be a problem throughout the bout, is that Hermanson was able to hurt Jacare on the counter. Um, yes. Some of it had to do with that defense that he was making. Like He turned that dynamic around because Jacare, 
he, he, he plays that game of, you know, well, yeah, waiting for the opponent to commit, uh, in this aggressive counter punching style that he likes to play. Um, but if you can, using that mixed offense, if Hermanson can mix his offense up enough that he can sort of tell when Jacques Ray is going to bite, Jacques Ray is also only committing when he throws his shots, right? He's only throwing big, powerful hooks. And so Hermanson was able to do to Jacques Ray, uh, off the back foot what Jacques Ray was trying to do to him while pressuring. Uh, a couple of, of, of key points at a couple of key points in this fight where Jacques Ray would throw a really hard shot and Hermanson would counter him with a four or five punch combination, uppercuts, hooks, straights, and then he would pivot and get off the fence and move away after doing that. Um, yeah, it was it was definitely also, yeah, Hermanson's ability to, which something which Weidman didn't have, was, yeah, Hermanson's ability to keep throwing whilst he was moving away. Yes. That Jacare was not getting in, like, once Jacare threw a big shot and had Weidman backing up, that was the end of Weidman's offense. Like, Weidman was simply had to reset so that he could throw again. But Hermanson would just kind of spatter shots in at him as he was as he was chasing. He was like, okay, maybe I, I just can't throw two, three strikes in a row against this. I can't just wade in after him. And I did like the fact that he he kept some of his punches hidden until later in the fight. Like there is a real tendency for taller fighters to overuse the uppercut. Mm-hmm. And he kept it relatively shelved Mm -hmm. and when he used it it hurt jacare because jacare just wasn't expecting it he'd Mm -hmm. been chasing down through you know barrages of straight punches for two three rounds by that point and hermanson just clipped him with a beautiful uppercut yep he relied almost entirely for most of the fight on straight punches which are you can't overuse straight punches you know like that's that's the the meat and potatoes punch you need to rely on especially that jab uh and yeah sort of sort of hid the um, potentially more dangerous for both fighters punches like uppercuts and hooks deeper into the exchanges and deeper into the fight. Um, another thing we have to talk about, uh, and this is also essential to one's ability to combat pressure. We talk about this all the time, or at least I do constantly banging on about this is the fact that uh, in MMA, the, the dynamic, the outfighter dynamic is different. Uh, and forces different actions out of the fighters. There's a reason we see fighters like Edson Barboza, who get started running backwards and then can't seem to stop uh, because they realize that in order to fight back, they have to plant their feet. And especially if the pressure fighter is a grappler or stronger in the clinch, that means they're going to have to tie up. And so they lose what good outfighters, uh, what good outfighting boxers uh, always do, which is to close the distance on their terms, to pick the right moment, to stop retreating, either step in with a punch or step in, smother the offense coming at you and get into the clinch. Um, and in MMA, obviously, that's different because the fight doesn't break after the clinch. Uh, you can get taken down. You can get beaten up with elbows and knees. There's so much more to worry about. And um, yeah, in this matchup, Jack Hermanson more than once took Jacare down and he almost fucking got him with that Schultz headlock style <laughs> guillotine. He almost, and after that, he got him. Jacare defended perfectly. Hermanson almost took and took his back and got him with the fucking dragon sleeper hold. Like what the hell? He almost got him. <laughs> have you ever, have you seen the one example of that submission that exists? No. The dragon sleeper. <laughs> it is essentially you have someone's back and instead of choking around their head is sort of like a reverse guillotine you have their arm sticking through your underarm and you're wrapping around from behind so when you arch your back uh to when you push your hips to apply pressure with the choke you are arching their back in addition to choking them it's a horribly uncomfortable position hermanson almost found it off of that um that deep uh, some people are calling it a reverse arm triangle some people are calling it a you know i, I always think of the the mark schultz headlock uh, like that's how Matt Hughes hit it back when he got that same submission, but he almost hit that shit on Jacare, and we sort of touched on this. We're like, you know, Hermanson's really confident. He seems really capable on the ground, and it's just at that point in Jacare's career where 
If you stick to the right positions, you make sure you keep him on the bottom, you fight him intelligently, and you're, you're confident – you have deserved confidence on the ground that you just rely on making the right moves and not letting his aura affect you. You could potentially outgrapple Jacare, and f- Jack Hermanson did. That's crazy. He did it. Like I know we said it was a possibility here, but like it's yeah. still the first time we've seen it happen. Yeah, and I mean, incredible. Yeah. Um, I think he, after he hit his first major takedown, I think he went he went back to the well a bit too much. In the I think it was in in, in the second round, he managed to keep Jack Ray down for a long time, and then he was in the third round. You could see he was clearly thinking, "Wow, this is a really good solution to Jack Ray's uh-huh. pressure," and he got himself into bad trouble uh-huh. going back to the well too many times because planting for takedown shots got him walked down and kind of fucked up. Mm-hmm. But you know, did an amazing job in getting back uh, in just, you know, getting back to the game plan and, you know, going back to the striking and opened up the takedowns for himself again. Like, it really was like a, a masterful performance from him. Yeah. And, you know, we, we still got those those Jacare moments, you know, where he's just got that unbreakable competitive spirit mm-hmm. and he just came after Hermanson like a fucking Terminator in the, I think, the third and the fifth rounds. Yeah, where he was just, where he just would not be stopped. But the thing is, you know, he just can't maintain that yeah. anymore. I, I don't think. And you know, Manson, to his credit, as we said, he didn't really. He, did, I mean, he kind of did at certain points, and I can't discredit him for that. He he was just getting walked down sometimes, but he was tricky enough and offensive enough that, and you know, had just put such a pace on Jacare that Jacare just simply couldn't physically keep it up. Yeah. There was that last flurry, man. Like I said, I was rooting for Jacare. Uh, mm-hmm. He he basically did like having just watched it. It looked very similar to the last minute between Aya Quinta and Kevin Lee, where he was just yep. bombing him with right hands over the top. Jacare was this close to going rubber legged or going down, uh, but too little too late. And, and Hermanson managed after Jacare had a good third round, he started to stuff those takedowns, land the body shots, put his combinations together. Hermanson went back to his jab, started to land his counters, forgot about the takedowns for a little while, and relied on his footwork in the fourth. Like, not only did he come into this fight with a great game plan, but he managed to adjust to a shift in momentum midway through the fight and keep that strategy working. Uh, in the face of, like... Yeah, like Jacare is an intelligent fighter who knows how to adjust. He he's like one of my favorite things about this latter day Jacare game is um his defensive acumen and his his ability to sniff out counter punching opportunities and uh whether stuffing takedowns or avoiding punches and then coming back. And um yeah, it just wasn't enough. And yeah, he couldn't push the pace hard enough and it sucks saying that cuz like you just want to say Jacare was a little younger. But then again when Jacare was younger, um he didn't really fight like this. Yep. So um, it's possible that Hermanson would have had an easier time beating him, at least on the feet. So uh, a great performance by Jack Hermanson. Um, also a great showing from Jacare. He did everything he could, man, as a 39-year-old who's had a very long career, not just in this sport. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested to see Hermanson, you know, in he's earned a shot at some of the, you know, real elite. Mm-hmm middleweights and you know a lot of those seem like they're real tough matchups for him but then this seemed like it was a real tough matchup for him mm-hmm. and i think the most logical one seems to be if if gastelum can heal up then if he gets that fight i think Hermanson can totally win that fight yeah and never uh, underestimate the value of confidence like who knows how Hermanson would have looked here if he had not just submitted dave branch in 30 seconds in this previous fight like with each yeah. more and more impressive win Hermanson is going to believe that he belongs at the top of this division. And that yep. means a lot. Yep. And someone like Gastelum, you know, lost, uh, he lost to Neil Magny in the past. And so I would not be entirely, I wouldn't be entirely surprised to see him lose to Mega Neil Ultra Magny, <laughs> which is what Jack Hermanson is increasingly turning into. <laughs> I love that fucking nickname. <laughs> Mega Neil Ultra Magny. It's. Terrible and wonderful all at once. Um, okay, before we move on to this undercard, do we want to hit uh, McDonald Fitch real quick? Uh, yeah. This was clearly uh, this was a very weird fight. Mm-hmm. Um, 
McDonald is clearly going through some things at the moment. Um, but he, he kind of mostly looked like Rory McDonald. Yeah. He's going through some things, for example, the Bible. But yes, yes. he, uh, I kind of want to talk about that. His assessment after this fight was he doesn't want to hurt people anymore. He's lost that killer instinct. And like, fine, I get that. You know, like fighting's got to take a toll on you mentally and emotionally. And not everyone's cut out for it. And McDonald's had a really, really difficult and long career for a guy who's still as young as he is. Um, but do those comments to you line up with what you saw from this performance? Because I also thought he kind of looked like Rory McDonald. Uh, yeah, I mean, because he, he definitely hurt Fitch way right. more than, than Fitch hurt him. He was hitting him with some savage shots. He kicked him in the head about four times. He knocked him down with an elbow counter. Uh, I don't know. It looked like he was throwing with some mean intentions to me. What what what? Instead, what looked like the issue was like it looked like physical issues. It looked like he was not capable of reacting uh, quickly enough to what John Fitch was doing. And yeah, he, he's he's always been kind of stiff and slow, and he is really looking notably yeah kind of stiff and slow now. Yeah, that. His ability to react to takedowns just seemed incredibly off. Mm -hmm. And he's always been a pretty good, you know, he's always been a, a very hard guy to take down. I mean, who's really out wrestled him before? Yeah, it was incremental. Damien, Damien Meyer to some extent, but he was able to get up from it and kind of fuck him up. Uh -huh. uh, I would class Damien Meyer, you know, aside from all the, you know, from credentials, I would class Damian Meyer as a much better MMA fighter, as a much, much better wrestler than John Fitch. Yeah, he's he's pretty comparable at least in terms of like the unathletic but relentless wrestler archetype. Uh, Maya yeah. fits right into that. Uh, Rory easily shut down the takedowns of Tyron Woodley and took Woodley down several times. So yeah, that that that's what I saw in this matchup. Really, was like. Uh, um, I'm not like I don't want to I don't want to say Roy McDonald's lying about the process he's going through or this is how it's how it is uh, manifesting itself in his performances, but it didn't look to me like uh, he was struggling with the fact that he had to hit Fitch to stop him because he was reading eventually reading what Fitch was doing and hurting him a lot. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe what he meant was he didn't feel like he could go for the finish after he did hurt Fitch, so he couldn't go deeper into those brutal exchanges. He wasn't enjoying, you know, he was landing the big pinpoint shots, throwing with confidence, but wasn't, wasn't enjoying the violence that, um, would have been required to, to, to actually get Fitch out of there. That's possible. But, uh, really it just looked like he was like, you know, especially for a guy who's fighting John Fitch. You should expect those takedowns and everything. Um, and even some of Fitch's punches. Uh, he was throwing hard and with commitment, knowing that the takedown threat was already in Rory's mind. And Rory was just, it looked like he was having a really hard time seeing things coming and reacting accordingly. Aside from a couple of good counters, uh, and again, he did make adjustments, he just kind of couldn't, I don't know. It's it, it, difficult to explain why that happens to a fighter. Like, do we just take the easy way out and say, uh, not necessarily the a wrong explanation, to, but do we just take the obvious explanation and say he's gotten prematurely old because of how young he started and how difficult his career has been? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a combination of physical and mental factors. I think, you know, he's he's had some incredibly harsh incredibly harsh beatings i mean he's he's he had a fairly he did a good job throughout his career and you know for us Zahabi deserves a good deal of credit for that in actually you know not absorbing a lot of damage until fights when he had to mm -hmm. but when he had to he absorbed a tremendous amount of punishment mm -hmm. and he wouldn't you be know the, he's uh, the someone only, who's he wouldn't be the only man who seemed to have uh, lost what remained of his killer instinct to a war with Robbie Lawler. Yeah. And he started he started incredibly young. He was never particularly durable. I mean, you know, he he got he, his the fact that he didn't take much damage was literally because he didn't get hit very much. Yeah. But 
you know, he got he got badly buzzed by Che Mills. Mm-hmm. Like that just doesn't generally happen to like elite physical specimens. Mm-hmm. So I, I just don't think he was ever particularly a, a, a very athletic fighter. He was quite physically strong, but not overwhelmingly so. And I don't think he's ever like just to put it out there. I I genuinely don't think he's the kind of guy who was ever juiced either. And I'm not sure you could necessarily say the same thing about John Fitch, looking hmm. as he does nowadays. Hmm. Uh, 41-year-old, five-round physical beast John Fitch in Bellator? Yes, hmm. looking multiple times more ripped than he did when he was in his physical prime and after failed drug tests. Strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually do, and I, I never put stock in these things, but I do believe Roy McDonald has not used steroids I think he's like, as we saw in that post-fight interview, an intensely honest person. Yeah, he's always one of the things I've always liked about him. Yeah. So kind of sad, man. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I so I, yeah, I think it's a combination. He's he's still fighting because that's what he knows best. But I don't think he's, I don't think he loves it as much as he used to. Right. I don't think he's. I don't think he's staring at the wall of a sauna for hours on end thinking about fucking people up yeah. like he used to. Probably not. Now he's thinking about... About Jesus. About Jesus. And fair play to him. That's a, a better thing, probably a better thing to think about from you know a societal perspective. Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> but I hope he's happy. I hope he does well. Honestly, I kind of hope he doesn't go through the rest of this tournament. Because mm-hmm. now he has to, because he's still the champ, because it was a draw, and it doesn't seem like he wants to. <laughs> so Take the win over Lima and run with it. Yes, please. Run with it. Please, Rory, if you don't want to, don't do it. Just don't. It's fine. You know, you had a great career, buddy. You you, you're, you were amazing. Um, all right. Um, okay, well, we have basically no time left at all, so I think we're sadly going to have to skip uh, Mike Perry's incredible comeback win <laughs> over Cowboy <laughs> Oliveira in one of the silliest, uh, the silliest super athlete. Like this was the welterweight version of what Brunson Tiago Sil- Santos would have been. Um, this fight was so amazing. It was outrageous. It was so dumb. <laughs> Instead, let's just have say a couple brief words about Corey Sandhagen versus John Lineker. Uh, a lot of people were upset about this decision because everyone loves John Lineker and, um, I must admit, I know this is uh, breaking kayfabe, but I also like John Lineker, and uh, you have to marvel at the way he fights. The thing with the thing with a guy like Lineker is he believes wholeheartedly in his toughness, and he has every reason to. Right? He he got his he got his jawbone snapped in two by T.J. Dillashaw, and Dillashaw took his foot off the gas for thirty seconds at the end of that fight, in which he had almost entirely dominated Lineker, and Lineker shredded his organs and ribs with the hardest punches he could possibly throw. He backed him up to the fence and just tried to murder him, and. That is what John Lineker does, right? He's one of those fighters who the, the same rules that usually apply fighting someone else do not apply to him. Usually you hit someone with a hard jab, they back off, they reconsider what they were doing, they react to that in some way that is not um, trying to kill you. <laughs> John Lineker believes that if you are hitting him, he can swing right through whatever you're throwing and hit you three times as hard. And that is how he fights. And that is a uniquely difficult test for a young and inexperienced fighter, especially one like Corey Sandhagen, who's not always shown the best defensive instincts, has some defensive moves, but hasn't always shown the most airtight defense. All of that being said, and saying that I did kind of think John Lineker won this fight, Corey Sandhagen fought an excellent fight against John Lineker. For such a young and inexperienced fighter, he did exactly – he was not Rob Font in this matchup. He looked ready for it. He knew what he needed to do, and he did it. Yeah, this was uh, this was a great performance, which I, I fear Mike has been slightly overwhelmed by people saying that it was a robbery. And it wasn't a robbery. I, I, I also scored it for Lineker. It was close. I thought – yeah. But I thought he he like Sandhagen was saying that he he scored thought he scored the cleaner shots than Lineker, and I'm really not sure that was true, particularly in in that first yeah. round, which is the pivotal one. Yeah. But it is also true that like Sandhagen definitely won 
the mental battle of which was the better fight to go, which of the better fight in this one, because the one thing, you know, we pointed out he needed to do was he needed to, he needed to take the initiative. He is not a, he, he might model himself after Dominic Cruz, but he is not Dominic Cruz. Dominic mm-hmm. Cruz probably could in his physical prime, probably would beat John Lineker fairly handily. Oh yeah. But, Sandhagen is not that kind of wrestler, and he's not doesn't have that kind of defense. And but so what Sandhagen had to do was he had to force John Lineker back, and he did. He was constantly for those first two rounds. He was constantly in the middle of the cage, making sure he was first every single time. Mm-hmm. And when Lineker was swinging back, it was with big shots that occasionally Sandhagen got hit by, but he was at least mostly blocking them. Mm-hmm. And he did tremendously well, even when he'd get, he'd, he'd, he'd like partially block a body shot, head shot combination, right? And getting hit like that by John Lineker must be genuinely awful. Mm-hmm. And the natural thing to do in that situation is to back up and get back to the fence and just try and regroup. To his credit, Sandhagen pretty much never did that. Uh-huh. At least in those first two rounds, he would back up and then he would throw back. He would throw back again. And Lineker, to his kind of discredit, fought those first two rounds in a kind of dumb way. Mm-hmm. In that he was, I mean, not necessarily a dumb way, but he was doing the Jacare thing. He was he was waiting for commitment, and when he did, he would just throw big looping right hand left hook combinations and sometimes they worked like i said i scored the first round for him but sometimes they did not and the difference was that in the th- and the difference really came in the third round and that was when lineker lineker really changed the way he was fighting in that third round it wasn't just jab. <laughs> yes exactly it was a huge oh. adjustment yeah that was exactly it. It was the fact that he started to fucking jab, and he started to realize, like, I can't, I can't let this guy, this long guy pressure me, and then you know pounce on him and force him backwards, and you know after he's committed, because a because he's not committing much, b because I don't know what the fuck he's throwing at me, and c because he's not actually stepping back that much. I need to use a ser- a toolkit which can genuinely. You know, I need to use a genuine pressure toolkit on this guy. And then he did that, and it worked amazingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also a little disappointed that Lineker did not bring that weapon out sooner, uh, which is not atypical for him. He often forgets about his jab. But uh, for quite a while now, he's had a pretty good one. You know, it's... It's straight. It, it, it's it's a it's a this sort of tricky upward trajectory jab for this really short, stocky guy, and it's it's damn hard. It is what uh, boxing heads might call a shotgun jab. Uh, you have to respect it, and y- even if Sandhagen was using his jab consistently throughout the fight to great effect, uh, once Lineker realized that he could afford to just trade jabs with Sandhagen, he started to turn those exchanges in his favor. Um, yeah, it was a huge turnaround in the third round. The only really, really clear round of the fight for Lineker, in my opinion. Um, although I also thought he took the first pretty narrowly. Uh, but yeah, like Sandhagen's jab was great. He, uh, when he did have Lineker stuck at range, he did a great job kicking out his legs and his body. Uh, I really liked the front kicks. Like, uh, that's a great tool for this little stocky guy who's stuck at distance is just keep front kicking him in the gut. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to talk about just, just like Jack Hermanson, Sandhagen did a he uh, showed some really nice footwork. He stayed mobile, and uh, Lineker, like Jacare, uh, he has to plant his feet and throw hard. He he also sort of waits for the opponent to commit and will then exchange with them. But um, in turn, his own shots are always one hundred percent committed. So. Angular movement works against those fighters. Lateral movement, circling, it works against those fighters because they have to plant their feet, and when they plant their feet, they have to stop turning to face you. And uh, Sandhagen did a great job of sort of just touching, 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 fairly non-committal jabs, getting Lineker to plant his feet, and then getting off to an angle, and really not allowing Lineker to back him up to the fence with any kind of regularity until the third round. So, and even. He even hit his own his own like lovely counter double leg. Uh-huh. 
whilst other people might have kind of gone back to that well, and you saw that, you know, when he got badly shaken off his game, you saw why that could be a bad idea to predictably do it on John Lineker. The fearsome Lineker guillotine, the one where he doesn't yeah. even close his guard, he just squeezes your head yeah. off. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, for the time that, for the time that he threw it, I mean, it was a shockingly diverse, brave, uh, clever performance from him. Yeah, again, I, you know, stress again. I don't really think he won it, but it doesn't really matter because he he shouldn't have at that stage. Right. It's still incredibly impressive. Doesn't matter if he deserved the win. The 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 like, if you want to look at this in a the narrative of Corey Sandhagen's career perspective, what mattered here was can a guy at this level in his career, possibly be mature enough to fight the right fight against John Lineker. And he did. So I call that a win, whether it's, uh, it's officially on his record or not. Okay. So, um, I think that's about it for this week's episode of heavy hands. We've gone a little over time and folks, when don't we, <laughs> but, uh, some good fights to discuss and, uh, boy, I had a good time breaking them down. Phil, it was just a pleasure. And isn't it always, um, what do you have? Coming yeah, this out? was a, this was a good episode, I think. I think we had some really interesting discussion. Uh, but yes, I don't have anything specific coming out this week, but uh, we'll obviously be breaking down the main event with uh-huh. uh, David. For So we'll be talking Ally Quinta and Donald Cerrone. All right. What about yourself? Check that out on bloodyelbow.com. Likewise, look for the second part of my uh, long past due Israel Adesanya Kelvin Gastelum breakdown. I was going to put it out last week, and then uh, I got asked to do a Crawford uh, a Crawford uh, Amir Khan uh, preview. So I, I did a last minute article on that and put the Adesanya Gaslam one aside, but I'm doing a uh, two parter pivotal moments type piece where I examine basically the big momentum swing moments in each of the five rounds. And in part two coming out this week, I will be breaking down rounds three, four and five of my favorite fight of this year so far. So make sure you check that out. Also on bloody elbow. Also go to the heavy hands, Patreon, where I have just recently posted, excuse me, uh, two <laughs> boxing commentary videos. Regis Progre fought Kirill Relic this last weekend. Very intelligent performance from a promising and exciting power counterpuncher. Um, I basically posted that video, uh, had a couple of hiccups trying to find a place that would allow me to host it. Because uh, even though it is technically fair use, you know how uh, copyright rules on the internet work. Um, but it is password protected, hosted on Daily Motion. You can get access to that for three dollars a month on the Patreon. Likewise, the second fight between Juan Francisco Estrada, one of my very favorite boxers to watch, and uh, Srisiket Sorungvisai, who famously knocked out Roman Gonzalez last year. I did basically my first impression commentary. First time I'd seen either of them, talked over it, broke down what technique I could, got excited. And uh, they're good fights. So go check those out on the Heavy Hands Patreon. Again, three bucks a month for all of that uh, bonus content. And that's about it for us, folks. Find us on that social media, if you please. You can find Phil on Twitter.com at Evil Greg Jackson and myself at Boxing Bush. That's B U S C H. And otherwise, we look forward to talking to you next week. Uh, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands.